Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rick Shepler. I am the co-director of the Child and Adolescent Behavioral Health Center of Excellence. Um, we are located here at the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences. Uh, we are a part of the Begun Center um, <clears throat> and our own center uh, of innovative practices. So I uh, wanna welcome everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the current uh, state of the state, if you will, as it relates to children uh, with multiple needs and challenges. Um, and some of the initiatives that the state is undertaking and, and how we have, we'll be partnering with them to do that. First, I wanna share with you some of the, uh, <clears throat> the, the key initiatives that are going on statewide right now. The uh, Children's Services Transformation is a governor's initiative to improve on um, the services that are delivered by local um, child protective services and uh, PCSAs. Um, and that's ongoing. Um, the Family First and Pre the Family First Prevention Services Act, uh, better known as Family First, is a national initiative, uh, also to help transform um, children's uh, services in general. Uh, it is a 4E initiative designed to redirect. Uh, some of the four E dollars from just placement to, in fact, also prevention. <clears throat> Ohio Rise is one of the initiatives we're going to talk a lot about today. Uh, and Ohio Rise is a managed care initiative through the Department of Medicaid um, that is designed to um, create new sets of services for youth with behavioral health challenges and their families um, who are, and these families would need to be Medicaid eligible or qualify for a 1915 C waiver. Uh, we also have a crisis continuum for children, adolescents, as well as adults, set of initiatives going on through the governor's office and also nationally. We'll talk a little bit about the new service that Ohio has developed for kids, mobile response stabilization service, <clears throat> a little bit later on in the uh, PowerPoint. Also in legislation, we have an initiative called Multi-System Youth, MSY, uh, and it's for those uh, kids that uh, rise up in each of our systems and we struggle with what to do and how to help. Um, and so the state has made um, a committee at the state level to review those kiddos. And if they are at risk of placement, we wanna make sure that we're not having to do custody relinquishment uh, for the child to get a mental health a placement service. And so these MSY funds are intended for that. And it's also, partially why we're doing the Ohio Rise Initiative as well. The goal is obviously to keep kids in the least restrictive environment when at all safe and possible. Uh, but if a residential treatment center or placement or a psychiatric residential treatment facility is needed, um, the state has now created some new ways of funding and paying for those. So that's, that's a big change for Ohio. Uh, from a Department of Youth Services and Juvenile Justice standpoint, the Behavioral Health Juvenile Justice and Targeted and Competitive Reclaim initiatives have been ongoing now for quite a while in Ohio, and they remain some of our most successful behavioral health initiatives uh, that we have undertaken um, that I can remember. Um, and they focus on implementing evidence-based practices such as multisystemic therapy, functional family therapy, wraparound, uh, and others. Uh, Modernizing Ohio and Family Children's First uh, is another initiative that is underway right now. Um, 
it's really kind of a part of the multi-system youth initiative, but it's a way of um, retooling and, and refocusing the current children and family first councils across our state. Um, many of you who, who know about those councils know that they can be a wonderful resource uh, for our communities. Uh, the problem is, is that the state um, only has about $15,600 allocated for every county to fund these. So they have to be funded by the local system. So the bigger systems, like a Cuyahoga County, for example, would have money set aside for them, but the smaller communities don't have that. So this is a way of modernizing them and thinking through what would it take for those things to be more successful. And we have many behavioral health workforce initiatives underway and beginning shortly. And these will, um, we'll hear more about those as they, as they roll out. Many of you might be aware that nationally, we have a workforce issue. Uh, we've had a behavioral health workforce issue for many years, uh, and it's only been exacerbated through COVID. Um, so this is a real issue, especially as we gear up to implement new initiatives and implement them. <clears throat> we encourage you, by the way, if you have questions, to put them in the chat, um, and I'll take a, a break uh, during the presentation a few different times to answer those questions. Uh, we also want to let you know that if you do need CEUs for today's um, training that please fill out, um, there will be two links that you either are sent to you or put in the chat, um, fill out the evaluation, and then fill out the three-question quiz, which is extremely easy, um, so that we know you were there, um, so we can get you some CEU, uh, a CEU for this, for this hour. Who are we partnering with? Uh, we are partnering with many folks at the state level. Um, we, we have a longstanding partnership with the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. They have funded our Center of Innovative Practices for 20 years, 21 years now, uh, as a center of excellence for the state for kids of behavioral health. Uh, we are also working in tandem with the uh, Department of Job and Family Services to implement Family First Initiative. Uh, we're working in tandem with the Department of Medicaid uh, to implement the Ohio RISE initiative, um, which is quite exciting. Uh, we have worked on and off with the Department of uh, Developmental Disabilities. In particular, we um, have implemented this project ECHO through the Department of Medicaid and, and DD and MHAS uh, to offer um, high-level consultation uh, in a learning community uh, for providers out there that are struggling with certain kids and families they're working with and they need extra help. Um, as I said earlier, we, we work with the Department of Youth Services to implement, uh, we do the evaluation for behavioral health juvenile justice. Um, we also work with the, the Department of Family and Children's, uh, the, the Family Council at the state level, I always mess that up. Um, and as well as many of the governor's initiatives. So as you can see, um, we do a lot of state work. Uh, that's where our major focus is. So who do we serve? Um, so we serve actually um, the providers who serve youth and families who have multiple and complex needs and strengths. Um, and we created a diagram just to kind of illustrate that. Um, so each of the youth that we that the providers that we train serve um, may have probably have uh, a significant uh, mental health condition <clears throat> that impacts their functioning in multiple areas of their lives, and they also obviously um, will be living with a family that has different stressors and and could have generational trauma. Uh, in that family, they could live in a neighborhood that has neighborhood violence. There could be family violence. We can be working with families of, um, of poverty uh, who have very significant basic needs uh, that affect the functioning of the entire family. Um, these, these kiddos also might have some major risk behaviors or risk factors that we need to address in the work that we do. Um, as well as everyone's impacted by life stressors and the demands 
And because our kids are multi-system involved, they may have an IEP through the school system. They might have a caseworker through child welfare. They might have a probation officer. Each of those folks have demands that, or case plans, maybe a nice way to put it, for the youth and the family to comply with. And whenever there's a compliance plan, that is an additional stressor to that youth and family. And I think we need to be aware of that and how that does affect each of our kids that we serve in their families. We've learned from the DD community that many of our kids might have sensory or developmental needs that we need to focus on. We're serving more and more kids that have co-occurring, um, that are co-occurring on the autism spectrum. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that we have to be aware of is how do we train professionals so that they are uh, comprehensively trained to deal with kids that have not only a, a mental health disorder, but also possibly a substance use disorder or developmental disability. Um, we have to be keenly aware of cultural safety uh, when we're working with the families that we're working with. We have to be aware of language barriers. Um, at the very end of our of the PowerPoint today, I'll share a new initiative that we have. We're putting out um, a series, uh, a training series on, on health equity and, dis and disparities. And we're real excited about that. Um, and it's really important to remember that all of our families have strengths and they do have connections. And how do we bank on those strengths and connections to build uh, strong youth and strong families? A lot of what we're talking about today is related to building a comprehensive system of care and a comprehensive system response uh, for the youth and families we all serve. Um, and I believe um, that a comprehensive system response includes a set of services that, that families are welcoming and receiving, um, a planning process to organize the care, a set of supports that helps families um, you know, stay in the game, if you will, uh, and then policies and resources that support all of the above. If you're missing any one of these things, chances are the, the response that you'll be delivering to the family, um, it, it, it might be necessary, but not sufficient in terms of uh, ameliorating the issues that they are um, dealing with. So what are those services? So as we move forward, we're gonna have services that are made available through the Family First Initiative, that FFPSA. Um, and right now that includes multi-systemic therapy, functional family therapy, uh, as well as Ohio START, which is uh, a, a service that has gone statewide, but actually began, began in Cuyahoga County uh, in Ohio. Um, <clears throat> We also have some home visiting programs um, that we are responsible for um, supporting as well. Ohio Rise has three core services, um, actually four, intensive care coordination, moderate care coordination, intensive home-based treatment, uh, and mobile response stabilization. These are a new array of, for the most part, a new set of services put together for Ohio Rise to deal with youth with complex needs. I'm gonna go over those in a little more detail as we move on with, with our uh, presentation today. Also what's new is uh, in Ohio, we have really never had a way of paying for uh, qualified residential facilities and, and psychiatric residential facilities. And so through um, the Family First Initiative, there will be a way to pay utilizing for e dollars for what they're calling QRTP, which is uh, qualified residential. And um, through Ohio Rise, there will be Medicaid dollars to pay for uh, psychiatric rehabilitation treatment facilities. So these are some new opportunities um, that we've never had in Ohio. And really the payment mechanism for some of them come through this new managed care uh, initiative. Also in that managed care initiative are, are these new planning processes, the ICC, MCC, which are intensive care coordination, moderate care coordination, um, that all use a high fidelity wraparound approach. 
um, to help organize the folks in the room helping the family, you know? How do we come up with a plan of success that is not duplicative, that supports the youth and family, that sees the youth and family as a partner in all of the care that they're receiving? Um, you know, and they're a key part of the planning process. Um, so we also have something called service coordination in Ohio, and that's delivered through our, our, our county family councils. Um, it's quite similar. Uh, and child and family teaming, which is usually done through our child welfare entities, in particular, Ohio Start. It's embedded within Ohio Start. So planning processes are really important. Uh, and we are seeing more and more of them uh, being implemented across our child serving systems. Uh, <clears throat> families, you know, may need some treatment, but they also need supports, and they will tell us that over and over again. I need a mentor for my, my kiddo. I need them to be involved in pro-social activities. I need respite. I need some supports. Um, can I get a peer supporter uh, for myself or for my kid? Um, so those supports are pretty critically important. And some of those are gonna be made available through Ohio Rise and through a new 1915C waiver and a 1915B waiver um, that the state is, is, is initiating to support all of these new children's services um, and the governor's initiatives. So this is kind of new um, and very exciting. Okay, so there'll be money that will be made available for the wraparound planning that goes on these ICC and MCC services um, to help support the plan. Uh, part of that plan might be support services that aren't funded by Medicaid. Well, they can be funded by some of these, uh, these funds set aside by the 1915B waiver and the 1915C waiver. So we're very excited about that. Um, and as I said earlier, you need policies to drive this important system of care. And so, you know, we've had different initiatives over the decades, you know, I mean, the, the, the family council initiative started, I think in 1993 under Voinovich, um, uh, where current governor was, I think the Lieutenant governor. Um, and so that's, you know, now almost 20 years later, it was a very great, you know, very solid initiative. We've had behavioral health juvenile justice initiatives, et cetera. Uh, but it wasn't until um, current administration that we really pushed children's mental health and behavioral health forward in, the, in, in such a big way. Uh, so it's an exciting time uh, for uh, the folks that help kids. <laughs> and then of course the kids and the families themselves. <laughs> Um, so how do, how do these initiatives change, um, ask us to change what we do? So I think they're asking us to change our perceptions uh, of youth and families. You know, when we work with families, they often tell us we need to be validated for doing the best we can in a very difficult situation. You need to come in um, with cultural humility. Uh, you know, we do a lot of uh, home-based work. So I often say we enter the home as a professional, but also a guest of that family in their home and a student of their culture. And when we enter in that way, uh, we're more likely to be uh, welcomed and um, received in a way that they can receive the services we're, we're trying to offer. Um, you know, this, this whole idea of having an appreciative perspective um, that is a, a wonderful case Western idea um, is a great idea when it's applied to behavioral health and how we approach families. Um, they're doing the best they can in a very difficult situation. How can we help, okay? Uh, Ross Green has this great quote, youth and families do well when they can. Um, and I truly believe that. And if, if the family or youth is struggling, then the question is, what skill sets do they need to be successful? And if those skills aren't effective, what accommodations do we need to put in place so they can be more successful? It's really kind of changing how we think about things. Uh, I had a youth one time basically say, make a goal so I can reach it. And once I reach it, then you can raise it. 
um, he said, I need realistic expectations when you're providing services for me because I never got pizza on Friday. And what he meant by that is he was in a day treatment program and he was never able to make the point system. And so I always loved his quote, make a goal so I can reach it. And once I reach it, then you can raise it. Uh, and very importantly, never give up on the youth and families that we serve. So these are all different perspectives and perceptions that we need to have. Um, change our focus. We need to focus on resilience promotion. We, you know, so it's, it's, it's important to focus on risk. It's important to focus on safety um, and the symptoms and the functioning, but it's equally important to focus on what kids do well and what makes them better. Um, there was a quote from a, a psychiatrist from SAMHSA that said, you know, what makes you ill is not the same thing that makes you better. It's not the th same thing that makes you well. So we need to focus on resilience promotion, um, strengths, abilities, talents, accommodations. Uh, I find when I get stuck, when I used to get stuck when I was providing direct services, if I just started flipping the focus to strengths um, and resilience promotion, I seem to get a better result. And it helped me get unstuck in therapy. We need to change what we offer not just treatment, but also resources, supports, pro-social activities, opportunities for youth and families to contribute and give back. We need to change how we serve youth and families. Um, you know, when I started back in the 80s doing the service, uh, I started doing intensive home-based treatment back in 1986 um, with my, my, just out of my master's program. And um, it was the first one of its kind in the state and, I'm reminded that everything was office-based back in the 80s um, until we started you know, introducing these things called intensive home-based treatment and wraparound and those things. They really didn't take full, full hold until the late, probably 90s, early 2000. I mean, these are still fairly recent, but now we're really building systems of care around those. So where do we provide the service and how do we make it accessible to the family? Well, we go to them. It's a, the services we offer now are 24 seven availability, uh, available. Um, and we wanna make sure that the services are highly responsive to the family needs. Uh, we need to expand who provides the help. And, and so we, we use, we're increasingly using peer supports, um, family peer supports, adult peer supports, youth peer supports, um, as well as informal support systems and identifying them. Um, there's some really good research in the resilience literature that says adult mentors, especially coach mentors outside the family, are very powerful uh, in building resilience in kids. So how well are we linking our kids to those mentors? And when we put our, you know, when the school says you need to go to an alternative school, what pro-social activities do they have there? Or are they allowing the child to participate in and does that move alone start to limit um, the opportunities that youth has for those positive things that schools can offer? Uh, and I don't know that we use the faith community as well as we could or should in terms of how they support families um, and include them in some of our planning. Uh, we need also how to change how we support families, like I said earlier, in terms of validating and valuing them. But also, you know, how do we help them navigate the system? Um, if you remember these previous slides, these systems are getting pretty complicated. And this is only part of, you know, the child serving system. So it can be quite scary and numbing to a family when they enter a system for help. Okay, so we recently received the child and the behavioral adolescent. Um, Behavioral Health Center of Excellence grant. And uh, our job is to bridge research to practice. Um, and being at a university, um, we have the luxury of having all the most recent evidence-based and evidence-supported practices uh, and the ability to take them to the community of practice. Um, so the folks that are currently providing services in the community at our agencies 
um, at our hospitals, et cetera. So what we do is we do, um, you know, all the training um, post education uh, for uh, Ohioans that are providing these services. Um, our job is to facilitate knowledge transfer and to disseminate uh, evidence-based and supported practices to help the state build a system of care framework and implement it um, and to continue to advocate for policies and sustainable infrastructures. So what services do we offer a train on? What services do we uh, conduct fidelity reviews for? What services do we provide learning communities for? Well, all of the above. Uh, we are the network partner uh, in the state for multisystemic therapy and have been that for the last 21 years. So we disseminate MST in the state. Um, we are also um, the developer and the core implementator of an implementator. Yeah, I don't even know if that's a word, but that's okay. Uh, intensive, it's Saturday. You get what you get. Um, intensive home-based treatment uh, is one of our services that we created along with integrated co-occurring treatment, which is a home-based service um, designed for kids with co-occurring mental health and substance abuse um, diagnoses. Uh, at the state level, we are the trainers for a high fidelity wraparound as well, um, and the trainers for mobile response stabilization services. Um, we, we also have a national expert, Dr. Bobby Beal, who does, who actually just uh, finished co-writing a book on experiential and adventure therapy. Um, we do a lot of work on resilience and trauma-informed care through Dr. Beal. Um, we have uh, a number of websites actually that, that demonstrate some of these things. We have a Resilience Ohio website that has uh, many uh, resources and, and actually videos of families talking about their resilience. Um, and more recently, we have a Wraparound Ohio website and an IHBT website, that intensive mobility treatment website. Um, by the way, if you're ever in need of CEUs that are free, um, you can jump on probably High Fidelity Wraparound has our biggest array of trainings available, and they're always offered for free um, throughout the year. Uh, we also do the System of Care Project ECHO, which I referred to earlier, um, and we support the Ohio START implementation in Ohio. So you can see we're quite busy. Uh, we currently have uh, nine staff that help out implement this, and we're probably going to be hiring a couple more. In addition um, to those services, we're also charged with training on the Child and Adolescent Strengths and Needs um, Assessment Tool, uh, the CANS. Uh, the CANS will go state, is going statewide as we speak. It'll be used across child serving systems to assess youth functioning. Um, and many of you might be familiar with the CANS, but it's a you know, about a 58 to 67 item tool. The brief is 58, the, the comprehensive is 67 uh, items, uh, but it assesses everything from resilience to, uh, you know, areas of functioning that might be problematic, uh, symptoms and behaviors that are linked more to diagnoses, the functioning of the family. They also have a risk scale, which I think is great. I mean, it really gets to what we focus a lot on in our home and community-based services here in Ohio. So we'll be helping implement that statewide. Some of the core activities uh, that we are charged with doing through our grant uh, are listed here. Training, as I just mentioned, um, fidelity reviews for uh, wraparound for mobile response stabilization for intensive home-based treatment for MST. Um, so we'll be busy with the fidelity reviews and the training. Um, we'll be busy um, getting the evidence-based practices stood up and, and, and running operational. Um, we'll be partially um, responsible for helping develop workforce. Um, there are some wonderfully exciting initiatives going on at MSAS. Uh, I think they just got a HRSA grant and, um, you know, they'll be focusing on, you know, one, one part of that in terms of, you know, how do we develop the workforce, get the workforce excited about what's going on out in the world. 
there are jobs. We can hire people. Um, we can make MSAS or any other school of counselor or social worker uh, have a hundred percent um, rate of success in getting their folks connected with a job when they're done, if they want to get into kids' mental health, guaranteed. Um, we'll do coaching and technical assistance. We certainly help with a lot of policy development at the state. Uh, right now we're in the rules review process, uh, helping out the state with that. Uh, we have new um, Ohio administrative codes for intensive home based treatment, uh, mobile response stabilization, and this new set of services around care coordination. So we're helping out with that. Um, one of the things we do best is clinical consultation. Um, we only bring in folks that have been in the field many years and have supervised services and delivered services and can speak to the real issues that folks are, are running into. Um, so we do learning communities and clinical consultation um, with folks that have tons of experience doing that. And then we also have a number of practice tools that we are going to be putting out shortly. We have a wraparound toolkit, we have a MRSS toolkit and an IHBT toolkit, and we're just waiting for permission to post them and you'll be seeing them shortly. Um, these are the services we train on. I've mentioned all of them. Um, the one I didn't mention is functional family therapy, and that is implemented by uh, FFT LLC, the national um, implementer of FFT. Uh, and the reason why is because they are the sole trainer and sole fidelity reviewer of FFT nationally and internationally. Um, the other part of what we'll be doing is evaluation um, around this new Ohio Rise initiative and some of the Family First initiative, and that'll be done through our, our uh, the Student Begun Center, which is part of us, uh, and we're part of them. Um, Dr. Jeff Kretschmar and Dr. Chris Storman will be overseeing that evaluation, um, and we'll be looking at some of the CANS um, data as well. So more to come on that. We're still in the process of uh, working through what exactly the components of that evaluation will be with the state. Um, these are the folks that will be doing the services we'll be doing fidelity for MST. Uh, we'll be contracting with FFT to do their fidelity reviews um, and doing the high fidelity MRSS and IHBT, which isn't listed here. So this is. Um, what our quality improvement um, kind of cycle looks like. The first step in implementing an evidence-based practice is to uh, make sure that the, the site is ready. Okay, so we'll do a site assessment, we'll do a program readiness assessment, kind of pre-implementation, give them technical assistance on what they need to implement that program. Um, you know, right now we are in the throes of a, a brand new RFP going out um, for the care management entities called CMEs uh, that Ohio Rise, which is Aetna, will be um, contracting with um, these folks statewide. So they just put out an RFP for 20 CMEs statewide. They'll be regional. Um, and our job is going to be to help Aetna get the sites ready and make sure that each of these CMEs who will be doing the care coordination um, have received a readiness review. Uh, once that they're deemed ready and they're ready to go, we'll be training everybody up on all those services we just mentioned, uh, training supervisors as well. Um, and then there's that whole piece of then we want to start collecting all of those outcomes um, along with the fidelity reviews and look at those, what it does it mean? How is that uh, program doing? How is that agency who's delivering that program doing? What are some practice improvement strategies that could be implemented through either supervision, consultation, or training? Uh, and then you can just see that we would use that information to retool every year and create new trainings to, to improve practice. All right, moving right along. Um, we're gonna talk about the Ohio Rice services. 
Um, and as I just mentioned, um, you know, I probably should take a step back a minute. Um, the Ohio Rise Managed Care um, programs uh, will work, will have contracts with each of the um, agencies that are approved for IHBT MRSS. But as I just mentioned, those ICC and MCC services, those care coordination services, will all occur through those care management entities, which is an RFP process. Um, so it took me probably six months to be able to say this in a training. <laughs> I don't expect for it to be easily understood because there's so many moving pieces and parts. However, I did wanna let you know about it. So intensive home-based treatment is, is a service that's near and dear to my heart. It's something that I've been doing for many, many, many years. Um, for those of you not familiar with it, it's an intensive time-limited mental health service for youth with serious emotional disabilities and their families. It is provided wholly in their home, school, and community where that youth lives and functions. Um, the goal is to keep kids in the least restrictive environment uh, and prevent placement and, or, you know, reunify from placement. It's a comprehensive set of therapeutic and rehabilitative services. Uh, and this next slide, uh, you know, talks a little bit about that. That comprehensive service array all the way down includes um, individual and family therapy. It includes service coordination. It includes resilience promotion. It includes, um, you know, safety planning and crisis intervention. So all of these things that go into intensive home base make it this comprehensive integrated service that comes to the family. So it's really a, a treatment of access. Um, it is fairly brief, three to five months. Uh, on average in Ohio, I think it's, uh, it's been averaging around four and a half months. Uh, the caseloads are smaller, uh, four to six for an individual provider. Um, we're also creating a brand new thing, uh, which is a hybrid teamed model where you would have a licensed professional and an unlicensed professional sharing uh, a set of cases. Uh, and it's our way of expanding the intensive home based into rural communities where they're struggling it, uh, in a big way to get uh, licensed folks uh, to implement the service. These services are implemented very intensively, four to eight hours per week uh, per family. Um, and the supervision looks different because we ask for dedicated super supervisors to the program, active clinical supervision, 24 seven availability um, and crisis response as well. Um, the main age group that we're serving is around five to 18, though it's really available to anyone under the age of 21 in Ohio. Um, you can see here in this chart, I also included multisystemic therapy and functional family therapy um, because they're, they're services that often get compared to IHBT. MST is and FFT are the strong, have the strongest uh, amount of evidence uh, of probably any child uh, or adolescent treatment service for mental health and behavioral health. Um, MST utilizes an intensive home-based treatment service delivery model. So you're gonna see it almost looks identical to IHBT and vice versa, you know. Um, they are a family therapy model. They work primarily with the parent to affect change in the family. Uh, so that's one difference. Um, they have to follow the MST model and they have weekly consultation with an MST expert. So that's also different. Uh, functional family therapy, you can see here, higher caseloads, they're not on call to their families, less intensively delivered, um, but that's how the model is designed. It can be delivered in a home and or an office. Um, very intensive consultation to the therapist so that they can um, implement the service and they use a traditional family therapy approach where the whole family has to be um, in the room to get the treatment. So that's a quick drive-by of intensive home base. And here we go into mobile response stabilization service. Um, so when you think about mobile, 
mobile response stabilization. I, I think about it on a continuum of development where back in the 80s, we had early 80s, we had crisis hotlines. And in those crisis hotlines, they were mostly for adults. And then once we decided that, oh, kids also have problems, we might have hired a kid person, you know, that could staff maybe one shift, right, in a, in a hotline. Um, fast forward, you know, 10, 15 years later, we started developing mobile crisis response programs. Those mobile crisis response programs were, you know, housed out of the hotline agency, uh, but they had the capability of responding in person to where the crisis was. Um, you know, they triaged, they tried to stabilize over the phone, uh, and a portion of the time they would go out. Um, and when they went out, they, the purpose was to stabilize that crisis right then and there. Um, and they might be available for a follow-up, you know, for about 24, 48 hours. Um, fast forward, uh, the newest iteration of, I think, what mobile crisis response uh, is, is mobile response stabilization service. Um, and what's different about the service, a couple of things, family defines the crisis, okay? If the family requests for the, uh, they call in and request somebody to come out, it's a responsibility of that service to go out within 60 minutes of the hotline call. Um, as you can see, as soon as I start talking about this, it feels heavy because you, know, you, need, you need to have enough staffing to do it. Um, and it's followed up with a 72 hour stabilization period at the family's home. And the family can also benefit if they want to with an ongoing four to six weeks stabilization. So you can see it's up to six weeks of stabilization that the family would get all the while this team is building skills, doing safety plans, monitoring safety plans, and then linking this youth to treatment services or ongoing services. So you can start to see how this service looks a little different, uh, feels a little different, um, and it's brand new to Ohio. We've just been implementing it through our Engage 2.0 grant, which is a SAMHSA system of care grant. Uh, and we have about, mm, seven programs implementing it in about 12 counties right now, but we're gonna expand shortly on that. And I know Cuyahoga County, uh, for example, is uh, already planning uh, about how they're going to do implement that service in Cuyahoga County. Intensive care coordination. Um, and I'm going a little bit quickly here because I wanna leave some time for questions because I see we have some in the chat. Um, intensive care coordination and moderate care coordination are, are also new services. We have not implemented them yet in Ohio. Um, we've done something very similar because we've done a lot of high fidelity wraparound and we've done you know, service coordination and child family teaming in Ohio. So it's not a new service to Ohio. In fact, we've been doing some type of high fidelity wraparound care coordination since 1990. So these aren't new but the way we're paying for them is new, okay? Um, through this managed care CME entity, uh, per member per month kind of an approach. Uh, and we're hoping that it pays for the service in a better way, a more comprehensive way. What are the key characteristics uh, of high fidelity wraparound? Well, it's a team-based planning process uh, where the youth and family are partners in the planning it's need-driven rather than service-driven. So you're not just looking at what services do we have available in our community. You're saying, what needs does this youth and family have and what do we need to build? Uh, they are uniquely designed plans um, that might include formal services, but it also might include created interventions, adapted services. And it highly promotes youth and family voice and partnerships. Um, the main difference between the two services, intensive care coordination and moderate care coordination, is um, really caseload. Um, and well, let me just say this. Intensive care coordination has a caseload of 1 to 10, uh, and moderate has a caseload of 1 to 25. Because the caseload 
for moderate care coordination is 25, they will have a difficult time doing the full blown high fidelity wraparound model. So it will have to be adjusted. They will focus more on organizing the services that exist and the sequencing of those services and the linkage of services. High fidelity wraparound through an intensive care coordination process will be will last longer, will be more intensive, and will focus on building new things that may not exist in the community to help that family. Uh, this slide is just to compare uh, high fidelity wraparound to MRSS to uh, intensive home-based treatment. Some of the key things to remember are is a high fidelity wraparound is a planning process. It's technically not a service or a treatment. It's a planning process for the family. MRSS is a stabilization intervention. It's a crisis intervention. Um, IHBT is a, you know, it's a high intensity treatment intervention. Um, so in IHBT, you get youth and individual and family counseling and treatment. Uh, in MRSS, you get a lot of skill building, okay? Uh, you don't want to open up something you can't finish. And in, in four to six weeks, you really can't, you maybe even shouldn't do a lot of counseling. So it's more based on skill building, safety planning, and linkage. And then high fidelity wraparound is all based on uh, the planning process itself. And you can see here, there's different uh, high fidelity wraparound. Um, traditionally is 12 to 15 in Ohio, it's going to be 10. The length of stay is closer to 12 to 18 months for that which is longer, all these services are 24 available to the family. Um, in this, and I wanna go over just this last slide and then I'm gonna have time for questions. Um, so we will be doing um, health equity, diversity, and inclusion training series with uh, Kinetic McFarlane, uh, who is a psychologist here in Ohio um, that we work a lot with. Um, and she'll be doing the following five different trainings and understanding the culture of poverty, supporting LGBTQ plus youth and families, um, affirmative care to gender queer youth and families, equity and behavioral health for all youth and families in Ohio and inclusive supervision. Um, she'll be repeating these trainings um, throughout the year. Um, and I think the first set are in November, I want to say, and they'll be posted on our Wraparound Ohio website. And again, all of our trainings are free and supported by the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. Um, so you're welcome to attend those. I am now, because I ended in a timely fashion, going to take questions. So, um, it looks like we have a few of these in the chat. Oh, and I do want to remind folks that if you are requesting CEUs to sign into the chat, that would be most helpful if you haven't done that already. And Paula is excited to be here with me and, and I'm excited to have Paula participating again to see you twice in one one year, maybe in one month. Okay, and I actually am seeing people sign in, but I don't see any um, questions. I will open it up if you do have any other questions though at this point. If not, I will bore you with more information that um, I went through pretty quickly. So I'm gonna start boring you with other information. Um, because who we are is, is fairly complicated. Um, you know, we have been doing, uh, running the Center for Innovative Practices since 2000. Um, it was originally designed to um, support the implementation of MST statewide. Uh, and many of you might remember uh, Director Mike Hogan uh, at, the mental, at, at the then Department of Mental Health uh, implemented these centers of excellence. Uh, we were one of them for the kids. Uh, the Center for Evidence-Based Practice, um, also at Case Western, also had begun, uh, was the other one for adults uh, around ACT services and uh, integrated dual diagnosis treatment. Uh, and together, you know, we're still we're still there providing 
all of these services. And I think one of the reasons why is that there's such a big need um, for additional training and supports um, for these youth and families and adults who have very specialized needs and providers who haven't been trained in that stuff, right? So I think we're getting better, but we're not there yet in terms of, you know, in, in my master's program, um, you know, I got good at reflective listening and some maybe some micro skills of counseling. And that was about it. Um, I think we've gotten better about offering other things, especially a lot on trauma-informed care and things like that. Uh, but for the most part, when, when folks graduate, they don't necessarily know about intensive home-based treatment. They don't necessarily know about MRSS or high fidelity wraparound, unless they've had an internship at an agency in the world. So there is a need to do post-education training um, so that we can uh, continue the, the educational process so that providers can get the support they need to work with um, you know, some of these very challenging situations. Um, you know, the reality is, is that for intensive home-based treatment, MRSS and those things, um, we're asking, we usually hire folks right out of school. You know, that's where we're finding our major workforce. So we're asking the youngest professional with the least amount of experience to work with the hardest set of um, needs that are out there for youth and families. Uh, so that requires a lot of support. Hopefully you get that with the supervisor, but because we have so many workforce issues, we're also having supervisory workforce issues. Uh, so this, this whole idea of centers of excellence to provide training and ongoing support has um, been implemented and continued. So we're excited about that. And I, I think it will continue because uh, the need will be there. Susan asked, do you hire part-time social workers or only full-time? How do you find CEU programs? Uh, and do you have remote social workers? So in terms of the programs that I mentioned, um, intensive home-based treatment, MRSS, high fidelity wraparound, they usually do, um, most of them are full-time. I will say that. Um, I can't say that they wouldn't do part-time because I know many agencies will hire part-time. Um, and in terms of remote social work um, and, and, and remote counseling, there have been changes since COVID um, that I think will be kind of grandfathered in to continue uh, through state statute that will allow um, um, telehealth to continue uh, and to be Medicaid to pay for that. But there will be some restrictions once we get out of the, the, you know, the pandemic about how often and how frequently telehealth uh, can be utilized. So for those services I mentioned, it will be the expectation from the state that those services, once we're through the, the pandemic to be delivered again in the home and community and telehealth would be de delivered as an option only if um, the family was sick or you were sick or it was a access issue and things like that. The CEU program URL, um, I don't have that right in front of me, but if you type into the search engine, one word, wraparoundohio.org, um, there, all the trainees will be listed on their, um, on that website, wraparoundohio.org. Okay, other questions? So going back to just, you know, why we still exist um, is the need is, is huge. Um, and, and I think, you know, the workforce issue is the biggest issue that we struggle with um, because we just can't find folks to do the work. 
Um, and we've created these beautiful initiatives and we've figured out ways to fund them and created policies to support them. Um, this is gonna be a situation where if you build it, well, I don't know if they can come because we don't have the work for it, right? Um, workforce to do it. And so we're hoping, and we really have to focus on the workforce. We remain as social workers and counselors in our state and nationally, the most underpaid professionals um, who have master's degrees or bachelor's degrees. Uh, we also remain, uh, if we don't work for a state organization, if you're working for a private mental health agency, you don't get state retirement. So we have not incentivized building the workforce. And I think we're refocusing right now to do that. One more question in the chat. No, great program, thank you. All right. So, you know, part of the policy and advocacy has to be on how do we honor the work of the folks that are, you know, wanting to help in this way. I often refer to um, the social workers and counselors that do this kind of home and community-based work, you know, as missionaries in America. Um, and it's really not a statement about, you know, religion. It's a statement about, we don't pay you very much and you're out there doing God's work, right? Um, but it's, we need to honor the folks doing this work. You know, when I'm traveling and I see the big banners, thank you for your service to military and police. And I'm thinking, what about me? What about us, right? So we need to say, thank you for your service. We need to honor the work. We need to incentivize the work. Um, and I'll leave it at that. I think we have one more chat or a question and then we will finish our hour. What is the plan for advocacy for of raising the issue of the low pay and risks by made by social workers? Um, currently, Susan, there are a number of statewide initiatives. One is through the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. I believe the governor is also addressing some of this. Uh, they uh, MHAS just recently released um, incentive grants to uh, to to pay bonuses for retention. Of, of staff um, and they were not insignificant. You had to apply for them, but they were not insignificant. And there's actually more initiatives coming forward. Um, so that should, you know, look for that as, as you go forward. Can you email us the PowerPoint used today? We will absolutely email you the PowerPoint used today. And again, for those of you wanting CEUs, make sure you signed into the chat so that we have confirmation you are here. Um, and also go to uh, in the, uh, after, as soon as we're done, because you're going to forget, <laughs> and I'm going to forget, um, go to the links provided to you if you need those CEUs, per, can, you know, finish the evaluation and, and do the three question quiz, which again is easy. And it's not meant to stop you from getting CEUs. It's just another way to confirm you were here. All righty. Any last questions before we close it out? Oh, wait a minute. You can reach me at, I should have done this, uh, richard.shuffler at case.edu. Um, and I'd be happy to, if you have any other follow-up questions to um, send those to you. And there are no other questions. So I will then go ahead and close out. And thank you very, very much for attending on a Saturday. And I wish you a great weekend.